Okay, so today we'll do memory, the last lecture, and uh, the, the few definitions to begin with. So uh, memory itself can mean either of two things. You can think of memory as the thing that you store or remember, which is like what your grandmother was like, or it could be the stuff in your laptops, um, the memory, the physical thing. So it could be the, 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 the neurons and the synapses. Either of those th the two things um, can be um, mean, mean memory. Learning is the, the storage process, taking the, the, the input that you're receiving and storing it among the, with the strength of the synapses. Um, and then remembering is retrieving that, that, that this, this stuff that you've stored. Now we know a little bit about this learning process. We know a little bit about the memory, but as yet we haven't quite figured out what remembering, how remembering works. So very little is written about how you find you know, this information stored in these little synapses, trillions of them, and how you get it back out again. But anyways, so we'll, we'll cover the first part of it, how do you put it in and into what. So uh, we, there's, there's types of memory be, that begin with short-term memory. And the, the, the type of, we've covered before is, is working memory. And that's like the scratch pad. And it's, we saw that that was primarily in this frontal lobe here. And it's, as they s s see here, you could, it's st storing the numbers so that you could add them and the, the partial sums, um, storing the words in the sentence. Um, it's a spatial location of things in the room where you parked your car. Um, it's limited in capacity. Uh, most, most digits are, are telephone numbers are nine digit numbers because that's about the limit of what one can remember at one time. Now in terms of long-term memory, um, th there's two categories. One is procedural knowing how to do something, and declarative, knowing that. So knowing how is how to learn to ski. Knowing that is what the word skiing means. Now, the, the procedural, knowing how, well, that, that um, is things like skiing. It takes practice to learn to ski. It takes quite some time. I was mentioning I'm trying to learn the saxophone. That takes quite some time. Um, it, you're not conscious of knowing procedural memory. You're not consciously aware of whether you know or can or can't do that particular skill. You, you, you may know that you've writ written rid uh, um, a bicycle before. Um, so from that you can guess you have that ability. But the, the moves you make in riding a bicycle, you're not exactly conscious of. You, 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 you do it automatically. And the moves you make in, in skiing, you're not conscious of. It, uh, this type of memory develops right from birth. There's all kinds of things involved in the ability to see that starts from the moment we're born, and even before we're born. And we'll talk later about having amnesia, and, but this type of memory is not affected by amnesia. And it's stored all over the place. So we saw, for example, that uh, V1 cells get their ability, to develop their ability to, be, to see in stereo, stereopsis by binocular cells, early in that uh, first 
year of life. And then um, at the same time, the skiing abilities and uh, motor skills develop all through life. And they're all over the place. The motor cortex for a lot of the motor skills, the cerebellum for that adds to these skills. So the, 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 the other of the two types of long-term memory is declarative. And so it's remembering the objects that we have in, in, our, in our life and the events. Um, it involves associations. So you can um, associate a face with a name. And surprisingly, it, it, it's established often in one trial. If your attention is, you know, um, sharp, um, if, it, if somebody, if you have to, if the person you're meeting is somebody that you care about remembering, you could remember their names in one trial. Okay? Often, I have the trouble remembering the names of students, but that's um, because there's hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, now, it doesn't start, and one is conscious of remembering them. You, you know that you can remember a certain name or what something means, or um, so you're conscious of that. But it doesn't start developing right from birth. It, it, it's about till the age of two that, that it starts occurring. And it is affected by amnesia, as we'll see later in today's lecture. And the learning part of it, the remembering part of it, uh, involves a structure called the hippocampus, which is located in the medial temporal lobe. That's so it's underneath the brain and towards the middle of the brain. <coughs> and um, again, memories are still stored as associations in this, but mostly in in, in this uh, uh, in, in, in this inferior temporal lobe, but most association areas that, that we've covered are involved. Now, declarative memory is also has sub-compartments. It has a semantic compartment and an episodic compartment. The semantic compartment is it's remembering what this face is or this place is facts and com concepts. All the, what these words mean is all uh, somatic declarative memory. Um, and we've, we've studied where faces are represented is the fusiform face area. So whenever a face is shown, this, this part here lights up. And then, interestingly enough, there's another place here called the parahippocampal place area, PPA, towards the middle more from the fusiform face area that lights up whenever a place is so sh shown, like an Eiffel Tower or the, uh, some building in uh, New York. Um, so the, the, the storing all these places um, occurs here. So like FFA, if you don't have FFA, you can't remember faces, you have post agnosia. If you have a lesion here in PPA, you have difficulty remembering places. And similarly, there's public compartments all over the temporal lobe for different categories of de declarative somatic memory. Now, the second type of declarative memory is episodic. And that's remembering uh, the objects and places, again, but in terms of time, one person's pa past. So here we, we see the picture of my three kids. But some time ago, when we were in Paris, and I was on sabbatical for a year, and we lived in Switzerland, 
we went for a visit in Paris. Um, each of these now has two kids of their own, so they're, they're much older now. It's also um, the sequence of places that you pass when you walk across the city or traveling to some, uh, to some, to some town. And that allows you to store this map of what the city looks like inside your memory. Now, the areas that are activated it, when you when you first um, perceive objects is the same areas that are involved in storing these objects. So um, again, the fusiform face area lights up when we store a, when we first perceive a face. But that's also where you store that face. So when you lose that area, you can't remember that face or other faces as well. Okay, working, well, let, let's go through some of these things in little more, a little more detail. We'll first go through working memory. So, I'll show you a list of words, and without writing them down, try to place them in your working memory, because there'll be a test after. Okay, how many can you remember? Did you see this word? Yes. Good. Yeah, hit the table as hard as you can when you think you've seen, that you've seen this word. Um, yeah, that, 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 that was probably easy because that was one of the last words that you saw in the list. Not bad. Uh, that was harder, in fact, um, because it was one of the uh, f first words that you saw on the list. So um, this, this, you can think of this um, working memory as, as um, being uh, whatever comes in must eventually start pushing stuff out. And, uh, and it's usually the word that you heard a long time ago that's pushed out. Okay, good. But again, this was a harder word um, because it was a nonsense word. It's easier to remember real words because the real words will trigger memories, other memories that you've had, and you can hold that allows you to hold them easier. Okay, so working memory. Um, has a limited capacity, but luckily we have compartments, <coughs> and you can fill up one um, with spatial locations without touching these other two, the one for words or, or for visual objects. Um, and 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 then fill fill these up in turn. So. Um, You've got several compartments, and three of them are, are these, spatial locations, words, and visual objects. Okay, let's do another test. So I'll show you, there'll be two objects shown. Look at this X, and there'll be an object shown on the left and the right. And um, hit the table as hard as you can if you think they're the same. Is that the same? Nope, the object would different. Good. Good. Okay. So, now you might think that that was easy. You could have no trouble doing it. But if you think about what the brain just did, it's a little more difficult, okay? You had 
one object shown to one part of the retina and another same or different object shown on the other part of the retina. And each of those you stored as working memories, but for different parts of the retina. So how do you compare these different parts of the retina to each other? Well, one idea is that you don't, you, you don't um, remember things in terms of retinal coordinates, so not, 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 not a retinotopic map, this working memory. This working memory, rather, is an object coordinate. So you remember this whole shape in one part of your working memory, and then you can pair that whole shape again to the new thing that comes, and then tell from that whether they're the same or different. Now, how does, how do you wire working memory? Well, one notion is, is it's, it's a circuit like this, that an input comes into this neuron here and, and goes out over here, but at the same time, another action potential goes around and reactivates this cell, sends another output, and then goes back and reactivates the cell. So you have something going round and round here, reactivating the cell for as long as you want to hold that particular memory in working memory. And the transmitter is thought to involve dopamine, because there's a lot of dopamine um, input coming in from, from the basal ganglia into the frontal lobe. Now, long-term memory, on the, other, on the other hand, is changes in the synaptic strength. So you see, you start off with weak synapses, and gradually, as the circuits activate themselves, they get larger and stronger. And uh, this explains a little bit why, for example, reflexive memory requires repeated exposures to form these synapses. So learning to ski and learning to play a saxophone takes time for these synapses to grow. Now, the, the mechanism that forms those uh, stronger synapses, we covered at the very beginning of the course, I think it was the second, second lecture, uh, involves this NMDA receptor. And that receptor um, gets activated when we have a strong depolarization inside the cell. And that strong depolarization occurs when you've got several action potentials firing at the same time. And it's those connections for those, for those um, inputs that are coming in at the same time that strengthens those synapses, not the other ones that are happening at different times. They, so cells that fire together, wire together. And it's kind of amazing that that simple principle allows you to remember all the answers that you'll need for the final in several weeks. <coughs> okay, this is my granddaughter, and uh, she agreed to help you out on, on, for this demonstration. She was on Skype, and I took pictures of her to get this. I want to illustrate um, a mechanism of learning procedural memory. So, how would how do how do we learn procedural memory? Let's suppose we have this simple circuit here, where one <coughs> one synapse from here uh, causes is directed this thing to produce a blink, and another synapse from a light comes from this direction activate this neuron to try to produce a blink. You notice that here, <coughs> neither the light nor the, the sound produced a blink. So this is what is called a naive subject. Uh, my Riley would not be, is by no means naive. So what we need to, to uh, 
to do the procedural learning is have a teacher. And in this case, a good teacher is a puff of air. Okay. That puff of air always causes a blink. Okay. So we have something that, that is a good teacher. Now, how do we get use this and the, the, the what we want is the sound, the click that you heard, to trigger a blink. So not the, not the, not the um, light, but the sound to trigger the blink. So what we have to do is the following. What I have to do, as you saw, is produce a sound at just the same time as the blink. So if I do that correctly, I'm, I'm going to, okay, <laughs> wouldn't stop until I did it at least twice. So you can see, when I time my click at the right time, that is with the puff of, I got this synapse strengthened because cells that fire together are wired together. And now I have the, this synapse strong, and so it, <coughs> on its own, will produce a blink. So just the sound by itself now produces a blink. So that's why it takes several tries to learn how to ski um, and, uh, and, um, and in, in general, the type of circuits that are involved in that process. Now you notice that at the same time, this synapse here became weaker, okay, because it wasn't firing synchronously. Now, so all this strengthening this pruning and pruning is the basis of all long-term memory, whether they be procedural, as in this case, or declarative. And so there's trillions of these connections um, that are forming and changing in you, and each of you have a unique trillion connections, trillions of connections. It's kind of amazing. Now, if there's lesions of the cerebellum, this particular reflex, the, 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 the response to a, that we just taught uh, Riley, is gone. She no longer blinks to the cell. Um, because that procedural memory is stored in a structure called the cerebellum. Uh, the cerebellum also stores um, memories involved in something, things like skiing and bicycle riding. Okay. Well, I'd like to go over another, so another in interesting aspect of learning procedural memories. Okay. So I w would like all of you to try this finger tap. So the idea is to Mimic the sequence. Okay. Can you do that? All of you that play pianos will have no trouble. Okay, let's do it faster. And faster still. Now, try something else. Learn this sequence. Okay, now try the first sequence as fast as you can. Oops, now try the first, first sequence. If you try the first sequence as fast as you can, you would, should at least have 
a harder time to do it than when you had practiced it up originally. Now, it's interesting. So here we go again. We're learning the first sequence. It gets faster and faster and faster. Then we learn a second sequence. It gets faster and faster and faster. And then we try the first sequence again. We find we can't do it as well. It gets disrupted. That's because uh, both procedural and declarative, the formation of these memories is fragile. And when you, this the repeating, learning this other sequence after you've just learned the first sequence, interferes with the the the, the, the synapse formed by the that first sequence. Now, if on the other hand, you learn the first sequence, and then you take some time, then practice a second sequence, now you find that the first sequence is not uh, disrupted. Because during this long time, this first sequence gets consolidated. Okay. Now comes the real surprise. Okay, you learn the first sequence. You just test practice the first sequence. You, now you learn the other sequence. And then you test the, the, this first one again. And you find it got disrupted. Okay, so you learned the first sequence. You waited a long time, so it should be consolidated. But now you just practice it. That's the only difference between what we did before and what we're doing now. This little bit of practice. This little bit of practice makes whatever we, we consolidate here fragile again. Okay. And as a consequence, when we practice the second sequence, we disrupt the first sequence. Now, this, this, this instability of memories when we practice them um, applies for all kinds of memories. For example, um, when we remember old memories, um, depending on what, 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 what happens while we're remembering those memories, they can be suggested to change. And often, false memories can get implanted um, and disrupt those memories. Now, on the other hand, you can, um, with, with uh, not, not, not just false memories, but improvements on the old memory can also be implanted. And um, that, that's the, the, the purpose of having this fragility, that it's malleable. And most often, you want it improved upon rather than disrupted. Okay. The other interesting factor is you can practice this, then test it. Oops. Yeah, after some time. Then go to sleep. Take a break. Practice it the next morning, and you're better. So these memories can improve during sleep. Um, these, these synapses can get stronger. And there's some debate whether that happens. There's several kinds of sleep, sleep phases that go through. And there's a thing called REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement sleep. Uh, your eyes are flickering back and forth. REM sleep is the, the waves, that, brain waves that you have is almost like the awake state, but you aren't awake. Um, dreams are reportedly occurring during REM sleep. Or we can have slow wave sleep, which is a really deep sleep. 
Uh, so scientists are still debating whether it's this one or this one. That cause is the source of this improvement. Okay, so where are those memories stored? Well, it looks like these sequence of movements uh, can in part be stored in the motor cortex. Uh, we know, for example, that from looking at violinists, that if you compare violinists, the representation of their um, motor cortex on one side and the other side, um, the, 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 the hand the violinist uses for fingering has a larger representation, okay, because fingering is a lot more difficult than moving the bow back and forth. And if you compare sides, the, the hand that uh, is used for fingering is the bigger side. In terms of listening, uh, we, we know that, that if we get trained for a particular frequency of sounds, that frequency of sounds um, will have a larger representation in your primary auditory cortex. So that area will expand at the cost of the other areas. Surprisingly, if you do this test, so you practice, you can see if you look carefully, this gap between these two lines. And you notice that it's initially big, then smaller, then smaller. Okay. And with practice, you can make the gap finer and finer and finer and still be able to detect it. But you're able to detect it only for this orientation of line not any other orientation. And what presumably happens is that the, 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 the wedge that represents the simple cells at this particular orientation expands in size at the expense of the other wedges, other angles. So um, a lot of procedural memories and hopefully declarative memories um, aren't aren't don't you don't stop learning them at uh, at the end of the critical period as you can see from there and so especially elderly professors that are trying to learn saxophones still have hope. Okay, the next thing I'd like to talk about um, in terms of memory is Brendan Milner's famous patient called HM. Now, Brendan Milner was a scientist at the Montreal Neurological Institute. And um, one of the patients that was operated there was a fellow by the name HM. Um, and HM had an epilepsy as a result of a bicycle accident when he was a, a boy. And at the age of 27, he was taken to uh, Montreal Neurological Hospital, MNI, and um, operated. And what they did was took out um, his hippocampus, including parts of his medial temporal cortex. And they removed it bilaterally. And as a result of this, he had an unexpected effect on his memory. Now, his working memory was fine, okay? He could still remember the names of, of, of if you introduced yourself to him, uh, the per he, hey, Tim would remember your name, um, as long as he wasn't distracted. Procedural memories were also fine. Um, Language skills were, were, were fine. Um, language uh, requires a lot of procedural memory for you to be able to speak clearly, for you to be able to, to, 
to understand understand see see the letters form the words and so forth. Uh, Hatem could also learn new sports. He learned golf after the surgery and learned to do it quite well. What was the problem was his old memories were still fine. He could still recognize his mother, but he couldn't form new memories. Okay? He couldn't take his working memory and put it into long-term declarative memory. And so he could play golf well, but he couldn't remember that he played golf. What he had was this thing, an anterior grade memory. You cannot form new memories. Another type of uh, amnesia is retrograde amnesia, and you forget old things, and that's common in, in old professors. Now, H.M. died in 2008 at the age of 82. And um, remarkably, late in life, he couldn't recognize, recognize himself um, when he stood in front of the mirror because he would remember himself at the age of 27, as you can see here. So he would look in the mirror, and this old person that was looking at him, this 82-year-old, wouldn't look like this. I mean, you know, would wonder who this is. Um, he was, he lived with his parents and um, he, could, he did things like mow the lawn. He was good at mowing the lawn because he could see what parts he had cut and what parts he hadn't cut. But he couldn't remember where the lawnmower was stored. Okay. How does, um, how is the hippocampus involved in forming those long-term memories? So we saw that, that information flows in this ventral stream, goes underneath the, 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 the temporal lobe, and then gets transferred into the frontal lobe where you form working memories. Then we take those working memories and funnel them through the hippocampus. So we're, if we're trying to form declarative memories, we take all these short-term memories and funnel them through the, the hippocampus. And this hippocampus is an ex excellent teacher because it can form these long-term memories just in terms of one exposure. Now, the hippocampus is located at, here, as you can see in this picture, in, in the medial temporal lobe. Okay. You can see the gray matter coming around here. As we follow the gray matter around, the last point where we have gray matter before this, this, where this fold ends is the hippocampus. Um, we can look at it from the side here. It's not too too long in terms of anterior posterior direction. Okay, and we can see it from above. Again, not too long, but located here in the medial part of the temple lobe. Now, what's unique about this is that here you get a thousand a day of new neurons forming. Okay. So th this 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 brain area forms new neurons. All the rest of the cortex, except for the olfactory bulb, um, uh, d doesn't form new, new, new cells. Okay. And the, the relationship between the hippocampus and the olfactory bulb is close 
because um, the, 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 the hippocampus developed out of the olfactory bulb in, 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 in species. Now, what does the hippocampus do? Well, you can see here that information comes into it from all parts of the association areas, okay? Comes to it and then goes back out to the areas it came from, but also forming new areas, forming new associations. Now, in doing so, it forms these connections between, um, let's say, grandma's face and her voice. And so eventually, that grandma is represented in terms of a multitude of these in associations. And you have this very rich representation of grandma. Now, that, that, that the formation of these connections, new connections, involves structural changes, again, synapses, and the formation of those synapses involves the expressions of genes and the synthesis of new proteins. Now, what, what's important to realize is that, what, and what HM tells us, is that once these memories are formed, okay, once you form this association between grandmother's face and grandma's voice, you don't need the cerebellum, not the cerebellum, the hippocampus. Okay. Um, so you can then uh, just see her face and that'll trigger in you the memory of her voice or see a picture of her. Okay, so this, uh, you might, might have come across this author called Proust. He uh, remarked that when he uh, dipped a cookie in tea, uh, that would evoke all kinds of, from that taste and that smell, the, 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 this would produce a flood of memories. Again, because taste and smell evoke, are good at uh, evoking memories and uh, reactivate all these associations. And a lesion of one of these areas can get rid of the particular attribute. Um, now, what I like next like to talk to you about is again the hippocampus, but now in terms of um, cells called place cells, and these pl place cells exist in, in you, but they were first found in the rat. And a scientist by the name of O'Keefe was the first person to have come across them, and I think just the, a few. A month or so ago, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for this. Now, what did he do? Well, he uh, got this water maze, which is like a, a kid's pool. In fact, they used kid's pool. Um, and filled it with milky water. And the reason for milky water is... Um, he would hide a platform, as you'll see in a moment, in this water, um, and the milky color of it hid the platform's location. And then he take, took a mouse or a rat, and uh, oh yeah, he, they placed objects around it, so visual cues, then put the, the rat or mouse inside, and see what happens. Well, the mouse swims around. Mice and rats don't like water. They, 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 they swim around till they find this platform. Okay? So 
So the first time it took a while to, 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 to reach this platform. But if you take a, that same mouse on a different day, he's directed straight towards the platform. So how does the mouse do it? Well, obviously, he can see these cues, these visual cues, these objects around the, 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 the swimming pool. So he must somehow recognize this location with respect to their cue, these cues. And it looks like these hippocampal cells guide this, uh, are, are, are used to form the, the, the associations between this particular locations and this um, uh, stand, this place where the rat can come to rest it. Okay? So you can see that for this particular hippocampal cell, the activity goes up as the the rat nears this cell. And there are others rat, uh, cells that will uh, fire for platforms in other locations. Now, so what the rat is doing is associating those particular, that particular configuration of, of um, visual cues with this location, location you can't see. And because of the hippocampal play cell, he's coding this. So the, the if a rat is without a hippocampus is placed in this um, a similar pool, he'll never find this uh, or he'll find find this this uh, uh, platform with just by randomly searching. But if you drop him in the same pool a day later, he can't remember what the location of the platform is. But if you train a rat to find the platform, then take out the hippocampus, then the rat can find this location without the aid of the, of the campus, because he's formed those associations. Okay, a couple of other m minor things about um, memories and how they work. Um, now, the frontal lobe, we learned, is very important in decision-making. And so information from these various long-term memories um, goes to the, to, the, to the frontal lobe where we form these working memories. And we use these working memories to make decisions. So for example, if from the visual cues, you see that you're in your own home and you hear the sound of your own telephone ringing, then the appropriate action is to pick up the phone. However, if you're in your friend's house, so the visual cues don't tell you you're in your friend's house, but you hear the same sound of a telephone ringing, and presumably that's his telephone, you don't pick up the phone. Now with cell phones, of course, it's, it's, a, it's not the cell phone ringing, the, 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 the the task would be different. Okay. So the the working memory in your frontal lobe is very important for making decisions. The last thing I want to cover is the amygdala. Now the amygdala is located here in the very middle of your underside of your brain. And it's involved in things like fear responses, emotional responses to things, but all kinds of emotional responses. So I want to demonstrate
how I can train you to sweat whenever you see the color blue first. Now, I won't actually do that, but I'll demonstrate how one would do it. Okay. Now, that, if that sound was many more decibels louder than it is here, you would get the startle or fear response from hearing that, that, that horn and start producing sweating as a result of this. So let's suppose you did that. Okay. So every time you heard that horn, you would start to sweat. Well, with time, you'd, you'd develop strength of this because again, the horn and the, the sight of the, the blue light were paired. And as a consequence, if you were just shown the blue light, you'd start a sweat response. So, if you have a leaf of the amygdala, you can learn to produce this sweat response, okay? Because this input is no longer there. It can trigger that association. That fear is not there. And then patients that have lesions in the hippocampus, they can um, remember, you can still train them, but they can't remember why they're sweating. They can't remember that perhaps it's associated with the color blue. Um, you can do a similar conditioning, not to uh, uh, sounds, but to a, 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 um, a painful stimulus. Um, and um, then find that, 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 that every, and then play, played, uh, um, gave, gave some um, not as painful stimulus and, and found that whenever you showed the color blue, that, that, that stimulus would feel more painful. And the similar process might explain why um, whenever a doctor uh, prescribes you, can have a placebo effect because of the association between the lab coat or the, the clothes that he's wearing uh, and the person. So the, the amygdala helps uh, consolidate autonomic responses to stimuli. They sort of add an emotional tone. Um, they also can give you a sense of familiarity, which we'll look at in a moment. Um, and the amygdala is also involved in releasing through the, the, the adrenal gland um, the hormones associated with stress, like epinephrine. Now, faces. Uh, when you see a face, we know that it goes through the fusiform face area, and that's where you have this conscious identification of who that person is. But you also have a, 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 a connection through the amygdala that gives you the, an unconscious autonomic response, this sort of feeling of familiarity. Okay. And that, this, this circuit is a lot faster than this circuit. So you can have a sense of familiarity even before you recognize who that person is. Now, if you have lesions of the fusiform face area, we saw before that you get prosopagnosia. You, you see, you know that these are two people, but you can't recognize who they are. If, on the other hand, you get rid of uh, this pathway, you see two persons here, but you have no sense of familiarity. So there's a neat story I read about this young man 
who after an accident had this lesion here, and he couldn't recognize his own parents, he was claiming that aliens had taken over his parents because they had lost that sense of familiarity. So, uh, to end this course, one, one last set of hit the table as hard as you can. You have to hit the table when you see someone familiar. Not doing well. They're coming a little fast, yes. Anyways, what many of you did recognize, it just didn't hit the table fast enough before the next one came around. What is remarkable is, is, is one's ability to remember um, who that person is and add a name for them. That, 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 that information flows in through the retina into your fusiform area and activates fusiform area so in fractions of a second. Okay. And you do it without any effort. Um, and for example, this, this face is bouncing all over the retina and it's activating all kinds of, a myriad of different uh, retinal cells and yet you can recognize it as the same face. And how the brain is able to do that is not surprisingly still a mystery. There's lots of mysteries for you to solve if you go into neuroscience. Thank you very much.